The Speaking of Cults podcast is presented solely for general informational, educational, and entertainment purposes. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from it is at the user's own risk. The views, information, or opinions expressed by the host and guests are solely those of the individuals involved and do not constitute medical or other professional advice. Hello and welcome to the Speaking of Cults podcast. I am your host, Chris Shelton. Welcome to my show. I have been looking forward to doing this show for many months and uh, schedules have finally aligned and I am welcoming to my show this week my professors, my friends, my allies in the fight against cults worldwide. I am uh, This week I have Rod and Linda Dubrow Marshall on my show. Welcome to both of you. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. We've yeah. been looking forward to it too. Excellent. Absolutely. Yes. We're we're all super busy people and um and so getting things together is uh is always an adventure, even when we just want to chat. So <laughs> doing this has been uh been a thing. But it's been um I, I think it's gonna be something well worth the wait. You Rod, you've uh you guys have been on my show in the past. Um this has been something. Well, you guys are. Let me just say, let me just tell the audience in case anybody's coming into this cold doesn't know our relationship. Um, I did the master's program in the psychology of coercive control at Salford University a couple years ago. Rod and Linda are the creators and professors of that program at Salford. And um, as far as I'm concerned, they have done the entire cult world an incredible solid by putting this program together and training people in what coercive control is. This touches not just on the, the world of, of cults, but also domestic violence and interpersonal violence and uh, intimate partner violence, rather, and on the subject of gangs and human trafficking and that whole problem. And believe me, that's a big problem out there. So the subject of coercive control is sort of a a binding or, or way of looking at the behavior across all these spectrums or all these domains and isolating, you know, what's going on? What are we looking at with this? And how can we therefore bring about legislation that might actually regulate and stop coercive control from happening in these various domains. That's part of what the program is all about. So uh, so I want to lead off with introducing you guys that way and also, um, again, thanking you, actually, for putting that whole program together. Uh, thank you so much. That's very generous. And, and we're so honored to be able to have developed and to offer the program and have people like you come through our program. And to be able to offer it online as distance learning, because when we first met you, you wouldn't have been able to come. That's right. You know, so it's just a thrill. That's right. Yeah. That's right. We first connected in person in um, in 2018, I believe, in Philly, and you had, yeah. and you guys had at the ICSA conference there, and you'd put this program together, and I was I was so excited to hear about it, and then oh, it's in Manchester. Okay, well. Someday, you know, and then and then COVID happened, and and uh, and and distance learning opened up, and I was able to do it. And um, I, the way I put it uh, in summary, is you guys are creating a little army of people who are out there fighting the good fight. Uh, that's what I. That's how I think of it. Yeah, we had wanted. To, yeah, we had wanted to create a program like this for years that uh, looked at coercive control across the context that you described earlier, uh, and also the fact that we were able to move it to a distance learning platform in 2020 was really important too. We didn't do that because of COVID, uh, but COVID gave us the opportunity initially to experiment with what that was like. There was. Uh, the one year of the program where, where we moved from on campus to online like a lot of other people did because of the pandemic. Um, and then we really um, used that as the springboard to say, well, let's take the program worldwide, um, allowing uh, you and, and many others to study the program by distance. And that's really uh, transformed the program. You know, we, we really enjoy the diversity of students on the program from across the world, not just from North America, but from Europe, from Africa, um, and beyond. Big time. Yes, because people, you know, they apply and they go, there is no other program like yours. 
No. And that's why we need to be accessible to people, because at the moment we're the only people that focus on the underlying psychology that crosses all those contexts that you mentioned, because we are psychologists, and that's what really interests us, how cults and other groups get a hold of you. They get a hold of your mind. They get a hold of your spirit, your heart, your body, everything. And, you know, that's what really... That's what really gets me going, the <laughs> psychological imprisonment. Yes, course, I, I, you know. I agree. I agree. It's a, it's a fascinating topic. Um, and for those of us who survived a cult experience, um, it's needful. It's really, it, it, it's not just a sort of, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, it's needful to understand what happened to us. It's not enough to just go, well, you had a bad experience and move on because the, the, the cult experience and the psychology of it is invasive. It's a, it's a, it's a purposefully like mind invasion and it changes you. And if you don't realize that and see how it changed you after the fact and kind of examine that and kind of put things put back together, you could be sort of in a, you know, for lack of better terminology, I guess, permanently scarred um, mm-hmm. by the by the experience of it. And yet it's not necessary that it be that way. You can get over it. You can recover from it. You can get yourself back. Um, you can be better uh, because yeah. you've learned. Exactly. You, you're smarter about deceptive practices. You're, you become, you know, if you, if you get some help and understand your experience, what happened to you, it can actually improve some things. I agree. I agree completely. Um, well, on that note, I'm curious to start with how, what's your guys's background here? How did, you know, how did this, uh, how do we get from you guys coming into the world and, and experiencing life to putting this program together? What's your, what's your origin story here? You go first. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm unusual because a lot of people get involved because they've come out of a cultic experience. Yep. And I didn't join a cult. I, like many people in cults, I've been deceived, tricked, done things that were against what I believe in. I've been subject to group pressure. I understand all of that. But I didn't have it in an organized cultic situation. Um, so that makes me unusual. And some people think that uh, if you haven't been a cult, you can't understand, to which I would like to say a big message of cults is, you know, you categorize people, black and white thinking, like, don't do that. Keep an open mind about who who can be of help. But anyway, uh, I'm a member of a minority group. I'm not only a woman, but I'm Jewish. That's really important to me. And... um, I was really intrigued by the Holocaust when I was growing up. And we didn't talk about it much. And I found myself reading books in the library about it. And the thing that intrigued me is how could people be so evil? And not only people being evil, but regular, ordinary people, not just the leaders, but the people that went home and had family lives, and then they went and worked at the concentration camps during the day. I could not get my head around this. So I guess that was me being a budding psychologist. What's human nature like? What's it all about? And um, so I, I felt like the Nazis were like a cult. They really controlled people. And as a teenager, I saw some of the propaganda films that Hitler really liked, and I was watching them, and I I couldn't think. They were loud and marching and music and rah, 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 and I I couldn't think. And I, I think that's one of the things that happens to people. So I was very intrigued by that. And I didn't at first make a connection with domestic abuse, but I was also doing a lot of work in domestic abuse as a young professional. And um, what struck me about that was, you know, the psychological abuse is often the worst part of being in an intimate partner relationship where you're physically abused. It was just like, what part of you then buys into somehow you provoked it, it's your fault, you're not worthy of anything, you can't make it without the person. So I got very interested in that. And it was originally Art Dahl, the late Art Dahl, who was one of my professors at the University of Pennsylvania, who said, Linda, everything you're studying is the same. 
And I didn't even realize it uh, uh, quite originally. But that was my first talk at an, at, an, at an ICSA conference, which at the time was American Family F Foundation. It was domestic abuse as a cult. Mm. I did see those um, connections a long time ago. And, uh, and then I'll just add to that. I worked in a psychiatric hospital for five years. And I worked on a specialist unit, the sanctuary unit, which was led by the brilliant Dr. Sandra Bloom. And uh, so we help people to recover from childhood trauma. And I was reflecting on this just recently, that I was walking around with that roll-up poster paper, and I was writing down the things that people said about like what they believed about their abuse, how they deserved it, they were provocative, and all these things. And I was writing it down. And, and I was just thinking, well, maybe I'll write this up. Uh, I didn't at the time, but I was just so intrigued by that. I felt like I don't get it. It's like the abusers go to some school where they learn the same lines, even though they're in different places. Like they use the same manipulative techniques. Where do they learn that word for word even? And so that's what I was that's what I was observing. And I've been observing that a long time. Right. Right. That's really interesting because because uh, you just, you know, because all those things you just said are almost, you know, tick marks of all the things I've come to realize in my own study of cults and, and cultic influence and behavior was there was this point, you know, years before Salford where it hits you. Oh, there's a playbook. There's a there's a there's a guide that these guys must be reading because they all do the same things and and that was a real moment a, a real epiphany moment uh, I think for for me and and, I, and other ex cult members that I've spoken to when you realize that it 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 makes your experience not so unique and not so um, dare I say special but I don't mean that in any kind of you know harsh way just oh I wasn't there, there are so many other people who have experienced what I've experienced who I can actually now go relate to, I think, is what, what it opened the door for me about is, oh, wow, now I do find common cause with Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or Moonies or all these people from these other groups who, who I used to think of as you know, when I was in Scientology, is deranged cult members. <laughs> we were okay, and they were all the, they were all the crazy people. Um, so anyway, I think that point about, uh, about the playbook is really important, but it took me a lo much longer to realize uh, the things you were saying here about how when you move that over in the do domestic realm, oh, right, you know, for a while we were calling it a cult of two. Yes, or right. one on one cult. One on one cult. Yeah. That's right. To it. That's right. Yeah. And I think it was Rachel Bernstein who in, who introduced that idea to me when when I you know when we would do interviews together, and um, and it fit perfectly, of course, with the with the Salford program. Rod, what's what about you? Well, Linda and I did not go to school together, but you mm -hmm. you think that maybe we did based on our interest because even though my interest wasn't the holocaust specifically uh, my phd was all about how do we categorize ourselves in relation to other people and how that leads to prejudice and discrimination and those principles uh, that are pretty much universal in terms of the way in which people look at the world is, of course, what leads to group polarization. We have a lot of that right now and have had for some time. Um, but also that's what leads to cults and coerces more generally, being able to shift the frame of reference that people have for the world such that that becomes totalizing in terms of people's identity to the exclusion of other forms of identity but also in a way that means that it's at a polarized position. So the beliefs take over the person's mind. It's, it's not simply the uh, coercive practices, um, but the beliefs themselves place people in opposition to other people. And, and all of that can be explained in terms of psychological principles that have been established in the literature now for many decades, but have been, until the last 20, 30 years, not really applied uh, to cults specifically. That's really been the big change, I think, over the last 
20 years or more has been the application of particularly social psychology to an understanding of cults. And of course, that's one of the main areas that we feature on the Masters program that, that you undertook, Chris, was just trying to apply that understanding so that uh, we can not only help people recover, uh, but the other big mission for me is to use the science to prevent people uh, from being recruited into coercive groups and relationships in the first place. That what we need to do is use that evidence base and that understanding about how we all think and feel in a way to build more cohesive uh, communities where people are not um, at each other's throats metaphorically or defining themselves as having to be better than uh, everybody else. And of course, that's the common thread that you were just talking about, Linda, in terms of uh, cults and, and coercers specifically, is that notion, that unique quality. You know, my group is unique. And then let me say, for transparency, as I've talked about many times, uh, I was in uh, what I define very clearly is two political cults. Um, I'm sure the groups themselves don't define themselves that way. Um, but, it, but it was not that that led me into the field originally. I had the privilege of a student coming to me uh, back in 1997, um, and I supervised their undergraduate dissertation, and they then um, asked if they could do a PhD, and it's that PhD that led me uh, originally to the International Celtic Studies Association, which back then was, of course, called the American Family Foundation. Um, and indeed, that's where Linda and I met. Um, and it, it took a couple of conferences before my uh, road to Damascus deconversion, uh, where I suddenly realised um, that I had been in a political cult myself. Mm. So, you know, at that moment, um, I was then suddenly able to understand, because I'd done my PhD research about social categorization and mm. self categorization to go back to what you were saying earlier, I was able to realise what had happened to me. And I think that's the most empowering thing in recovery is to understand that it's not about you. Um, a lot of people that don't understand uh, cults and coercive control try and blame people. There's something wrong with you. You were vulnerable or there was just something deficient in you that led you to join the group in the first place. And that's classic victim blaming. It's classic gaslighting and, and some of the people that have spent their careers defending the cults uh, are very good at, at turning that around and actually saying that uh, this is the fault of the people that join um, or indeed just the disgruntled people that leave but actually the evidence is overwhelming in the research that uh, cults and coercive control affect people in very specific ways and the more that both survivors can understand that, but people can understand it who've not yet been affected, uh, the more we have a fighting chance to actually uh, look forward to the day. Sorry to start off so highfalutin and idealistic, Chris, but to look forward to the day maybe in the future um, when we don't have to talk about cults anymore because actually we can look back on that period in human history where too many people, and by, by the way, for me, that's anybody, uh, too many people um, were damaged and sometimes destroyed uh, by groups of this nature. I want to put that behind us. That's a, definitely a star high goal. I will say that. It is, um, it is a monumental task because I believe we are dealing with a sort of crossroads of, of, uh, of social pressures, individual ego, emotional needs for community and support and mutual belief, and narcissism. <laughs> you, you, you take all those things that are part of the human experience that all of us have in our lives. We've all got an ego. We've all got social emotional needs. We've all got a, a, a desire to be part of communities. There's none of us who don't want that. 
and you throw a narcissist in the middle of this. <laughs> you throw the, you throw the predator in there, and they go, "Oh, you want those things? Well, let me give them to you. All you have to do is be my slave, and I will give you the world." Right, and that is uh, sort of the the model of how they all come together. And so the only real way to stop that 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 I think any of us can see, and you you guys tell me, is that we've got to be in a position to recognize the predator before they prey, not afterwards. I think we have to recognize that there is a potential predator in all of us. Okay. And I, I actually think that, that that's the contribution that Philip Zimbardo and others have made to the field. Mm. Um, I, I wouldn't personally dress it up in the, the loose of a language if, if I was <laughs> writing it. But I, I respect the fact that Zimbardo did that because, yeah. it, you know, it's a way of getting attention to describe it in that way. Um, but I think the ability that we all have to categorize people, like Linda was saying earlier, in negative ways, the way I describe it when I'm teaching this, to, particularly to undergraduates, is to describe the ice cream preference test. I'll probably use some English uh, words here that might need to be translated. Um, but but I, I say, you know, pe people often have a preference for the cone, the ice cream in the cone. Is that the yep. right word? Yeah. Versus the ice cream in the tub. Um, oh, sure. Cup, cup. Cup, yep. cup, in the cup, thank you. Yep. So are you a cup person or a cone person? And uh, the way I like to say it is that actually, if you're really strongly either a cone person or a cup person, that's totally fine. If you look at ice cream in a cone, you think, that's disgusting, I hate that cone, then it, it really doesn't matter that you're not going to hurt the cone's feelings. Right. Okay, because you also have the uh, opportunity to buy it in a cup, or as we would say, a tub. And so um, the point about that is that same process of categorization that, that explains our preferences at that level are the same processes of categorization that allows people to say, well, I really love that group of people, the group of people that I'm part of that's going to change the world, and I just hate all those others. I hate the fallen. I hate the uh, lumpen proletariat, or I hate the bourgeoisie. And, and it's interesting, isn't it, how many othering terms there are in cults and indeed in coercive relationships too, but everybody else. And it's that that's the same categorization effect. So as soon as I think people are aware of how they categorize and the fact that you're actually in control of that, because there was a school of thought that if these were psychological processes that were kind of automatic, um, like we're a psychological machine, that there was nothing that you could do about that. But actually... I think we're in control of those processes. I can if I want, even if I really don't want it, but I can be, you know, I can make myself have a cone if I really have to, just to see whether it's as bad as I think it was. And that's the whole point about breaking down. I, there's a very moving video by Ivan Humble, um, who was a, a member of the English Defence League, which is one of the far-right anti-Islamist, uh, anti-Islam parties in the UK. And, he t and I can't say it as well as Ivan says it, but I'll, I'll just describe it. And we played the video on the course, actually, Chris, you may remember this, where he, um, he was very anti-Islam, and then he happened one day to encounter a Muslim man who knocked on his door um, and, and said, I'd like to talk to you. And simply by sitting down and, and having a cup of tea together, he suddenly, and this is his words almost, realised that Muslims weren't so bad after all. Right. So in other words, that category effect suddenly shifted. And uh, to use his expression, he suddenly left the bubble of hate. And everyone has the opportunity to leave that bubble of hate, you know, particularly if others can provide them with that opportunity. Agreed. Wow, that was beautiful, Rod. <laughs> I'm going to run with the ice cream thing for a minute. So what the cult leader does is he goes, you see this 
Ice cream in the cone, it really looks good, doesn't it? You see this ice cream in the cup? That really looks good, too. You could have the ice cream in the cone and the ice cream in the cup. You want to come closer, come closer. You see this ice cream? Look, it's up here. It's up here. Here's the ice cream. Here's the ice cream. You want it? Come closer, come closer. And it's elusive. What they promise you, you never get that delicious ice cream satisfaction at all. It becomes farther and farther away from you, and you have to do more and more because they don't really say to you, you're going to become our slave. They go, everything's going to be great. We're going to love you. We're going to have the best community that ever existed. We're going to change the world. They, you know, they're all different versions of it. Right. But they never deliver. Never. No, that's they make for sure. You a taste. If they give you a taste, it'll have salt in it. It'll have something bad alongside of it too you know yeah these days salted caramel is the thing (laughs) (laughs) well you know what encourages me and what you just what you're describing here and talking about in terms of crossing the aisle or building bridges or looking across at the other side is um a man named daryl davis who is famous uh in the world uh for being a jazz musician who grew up in europe actually and um came back over to the States, saw the KKK, saw the hate, saw the, the, the classification, if you will, of all all black people are horrible and awful and must be killed and all this. And he's kind of like, what is going on with this? And untrained, no psychology degree, no background in this at all. He just one day decided, you know what, I'm a little sick and tired of this. And he went and found and talked to a guy who was a KKK member. And he just sat down across from him and said, look, I want to understand this. I don't get it. You hate me and you don't even know me. And it was that question. How is it you hate me when you don't even know me that drove the conversation? And, it, and that first conversation was, um, was rather historic because uh, over time through that relationship of continued conversations, he actually got that guy to not only understand Daryl Davis, but he got him to understand that being a KKK member who was calling for the you know violent overthrow and, and death of all black people was actually horribly wrong of him to, to, to think that way. He had he'd had complete miscon you know misconceptions about this whole thing, and he gave up the robes. And Daryl went on to do that two hundred plus more times with various individuals, right? He's collected KKK robes from these people. Mm -hmm. And it's not a conversation of, I'm going to sit down and deconvert you. It's a conversation of, I'm trying to understand you. I don't get it. I don't get where you're coming from. Make it clear to me. Make me understand. And I can't think of a better way to build those bridges or try to, you know, heal those wounds or, or, or dissolve that hate than through relationship building like that. But it feels like an awful lot of people in the world these days have an awful lot of vested interest in preventing those conversations from happening and in stopping that from occurring, you know? Um, And I think that's where we get the weird, culty, divisive group think that goes on so much these days is it's an it seems that there's a that there's so much that it's an effort to to shut down communication well i don't know what do you think i was just thinking about how prejudices cluster together Hmm. so the ku klux klan you know clearly hated black people but they hate jews too yeah so once you hate one group you hate a lot of marginalized groups and, and minority groups and and it meets a human need that builds people's ego up like we're okay because we're better than those bad people that we don't even know, that we don't look at, that we don't, you know, That's we're right. different, we're better. And um, <clears throat> this is, uh, that kind of human connection is, is is the way to get people out. You got it. That's yeah. it. I, I really think the, so. That's about. Yeah. The, the trouble is, though, that, that human beings are notoriously inconsistent or inconsistently inconsistent and, and that, that 
that's and some people in psychology uh, i think you know spend their careers admirably trying to find the consistency trying to find the principles you know we often label this as theories or models um that that like are the silver bullet an explanation of whole ranges of uh, behavior whereas i prefer to think of them as as giving us a a snapshot or a sliver, a slice of an understanding of how people uh, operate. Because that kind of one-to-one that you're describing, Dale Davis, the same I, as I described with Ivan Humble in the UK, you know, the, these are mes- methods that work sometimes. Um, but we also know from the uh, uh, intergroup conflict uh, work that sometimes putting people together from conflicting groups actually makes it worse. Mm. Um, in fact, some of the work in the polarization lab in the States has actually shown, actually, that, that contact, because the, the contact hypothesis in psychology that is decades old basically argued that, you know, like you were saying, really, in a sense, people are ignorant of each other and all they needed to do was actually, you know, find out more and, and suddenly it would all be solved. But what that ignores, of course, is that um, there can be real grievances. You know, there can be grievances, disputes over territory, there can be grievances over resources, there can be historic grievances. And so in in the cult field, I think we have to also learn uh, from the different peace processes that there have been around the world. So in in the master's program, we also feature, you know, uh, examples and case studies, for example, in the Northern Ireland uh, Mm -hmm. peace process, where... Uh, it wasn't that the um, IRA Sinn Féin and um, the unionist community suddenly, you know, did come by R and decided that they suddenly agreed with each other. Right. Far from it. The, the feelings of grievance run very deep. You know, the atrocities on both sides are were, are still hurting many, many people and still happening as well. But nowhere near as much as in the troubles. And actually what happened was there was just this ability to understand that it might be better if I don't spend the next decade um, committed to, you know, shooting and bombing and killing as many of the so-called enemy, that actually we can find some common ground around, you know, building our respective communities, learning to live alongside each other um, without those hostilities. Not suddenly, you know, if you're a Protestant becoming a Catholic or if you're Catholic becoming a Protestant, not having to suddenly believe the the theology or the ideology, but but starting to understand actually that these are both aspects of Christianity at the end of the day and that there may be some common features of that. So it's not about forgiving. And and this is becoming you know, another theme in, in our work and in the <clears throat> anti cult field, of course, the cult recovery field, is you know, to what extent should people forgive uh, the people that have abused them? And I'm very clear that, that they should not have to do that. They should not uh, be expected to do that. That's At the right. same time, of course, there's a school of thought that spending the rest of your life hating and then thinking about how you hate the person that abused you gives that person arguably too much power in your life. And, and one of the things that um, we know about cults and coercive controllers is the fact that you don't have to be physically present with them um, for them to be controlling you and coercing you and harming you. Um, that you actually can be in a cult and you can go home at night. You know, you, the cults are not all, um, uh, you know, familial or where people live together collectively and so in that regard that psychological shift needs to involve saying well actually i'm not going to waste the rest of my life necessarily thinking about how much i hate the people that have harmed me i'm going to hope you know in a way that they can not harm other people that they're going to learn the lessons of what they did and in that way i think what what peace and reconciliation processes do, which is actually very different from notions of restorative justice. It's not about sitting down and forgiving the perpetrator, but it's about saying actually that I'm not going to let the perpetrator dominate the rest of my life. I am better than them. 
It was not my fault to begin with, and I can build a life without them being dominant in it. And the hope has to be as well that maybe some of those perpetrators, maybe quite a few not, but but actually if you take it at the group level, uh, the people in the cults that are still in the cults, I think can come to realise that the people that leave are not the enemy either. Um, that, that it's actually a cornerstone of democracy and liberal society, that people should have um, different beliefs from one another, and it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm good, you're bad, um, that actually we can live and coexist in ways that doesn't mean we're trying to dominate each other. So I suppose yeah. that what I'm espousing in my own way are enlightenment principles. Um and one thing I did learn from Marxism um, was that revolution was very rarely completed. Um, and one of the things that you know, neo-Marxism did, which was a huge mistake, was the idea that you can shift societies and everybody in it at a particular moment in uh, history, like, as Mao said, the Great Leap Forward. Um, what those Great Leap Forwards have always done is to leave, leave in their wake millions of slaughtered individuals and families and many millions besides who were not part of that great leap forward. So revolutions are rarely completed. So I'm not just talking here about the, you know, the capitalist revolution of the 19th century, what Marxists call the bourgeois revolution, but I'm even talking about the emergence of enlightenment principles that revolution is not over, um, and we have to revisit those principles, and we have to embed them in the way that we relate to each other, because I think that's the ultimate antidote to cultic thinking. And I've just realized that I sound like I'm proselytizing, and when I do that, I get very suspicious of myself, so forgive me. <laughs> well, I, that's the, you're definitely talking in very broad terms, and I appreciate the point of view that you're coming from, and I want to back up what you said in terms of enlightenment principles, because they're sort of the theme of my life and have been since I've been born. Um, and I think that you're right. I think we are still... Um, you know, a few hundred years after the original authors of all of this, uh, struggling with trying to fulfill the promise of it, the potential of it. I think there's a lot there that is put there for people. Hey, look, freedom of speech, right? We can, um, you know, you can go to On Liberty, <laughs> right? And you can dive into this, these ideas of... of you know, well, look, if we're going to have freedom of speech, then this is going to require participation. And this is going to require your commitment to understanding and coexisting with people who have different ideas from you. And it means, and, and real freedom of speech and real debate and a real free society means that you're committed to understanding other people's points of view as much as you understand your own. That there's a that there's a give and take here that is required, and that's an awful lot to ask of a lot of people. I, I you know I don't want it to be that way. I don't wish it that way. I'm not trying to say people are inherently you know monstrous or something. I'm not trying to suggest that. I'm trying to say that there's an awful lot of work involved. It's a commitment, you know, to 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 really enshrine those principles in a society means, for example, in a democratic society, it's harder. It's a harder government to have. Authoritarianism is easy. This is the rules, you follow them, and if you don't, the jackboots are gonna come and knock down your door. That's an easy yeah. society to live in. It's very clear. Democracy mm -hmm. is dirty and messy and noisy and very, very conflicted because people are free to express exactly how they feel with each other. But it seems to me to be um, a better system. <laughs> it seems to be the better way to go. And the cults, if we will, right, bringing this back to that, cults are, the, are sort of the social... What's the word? Uh, uh, manifestation, uh, you know, a smaller version of that authoritarian way of mm -hmm. thinking. You know, let's, let's encapsulate that in a little group. 
a run microcosm, at that one, you know? Chris. A microcosm. Yeah, microcosm. Yeah. That's it, right? Mm-hmm. It's of anti-enlightenment principles, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? I think that can exist at every different level within yep. society and at a societal level, too. And I mean, yep. I think the great thing about Robert J. Lifton's work, of course, that that arose originally out of the Chinese thought reform movement. Yeah. That's, where, that's what that's it was right. based upon. Um, and then he applied it, of course, then at the group level, and it can be applied, as we and many others have done, at the interpersonal uh, level too. But, but absolutely. Um, but the one thing I would say about dictatorships, um, you know, I'm always reminded of the Mahatma Gandhi quote, that, you know, throughout history there have been dictators, tyrants and murderers, and in the end... You know they will always fall, and they do always fall. So That's I right. think there's actually something about the human spirit that rails against that. Ultimately, um, I think you can only keep people down for so long. Yep. And you know, so uh, I always say this: that the cults that abuse people have got it coming. They have got it coming. That the choice is this: I think they, the cults, can open themselves up to public scrutiny. Um, they can be held to account in the same way as businesses and charities, non-profits, or they can use the shield of religious or political uh, beliefs as protection for the abuses that they commit. But ultimately, one day, the day will come when there will be accountability. And we've seen that happen with group after group. Yeah. And it will happen to all the groups that we could talk about for hours. Um, uh, maybe even the group that uh, you were a member of, Chris, we could talk about the day that that will come. That's right. That's right. Well, actually, I'm curious to, to ask you guys about... Um, Cults and the law, you know, I've talked an awful lot on my channel for years now about cult psychology and mechanisms and machinations and the psychology of it. I'm definitely a psych guy, but I am I am uh, endlessly frustrated at the way that they are able to skirt the law or get away with or or play the system by mainly, it seems, by... Um, taking advantage of their members, you know, to bring in more money, more power, whatever, so that they can get the best lawyers to present the best arguments so that they can skirt the law in every possible way, find every loophole, you know, and they have to pay the big bucks to do this. But, you know, one of the things about cults is they they tend to have a lot of money. So Mm -hmm. they, and I'm watching Scientology do this right now. And I have to tell you, I am more than a little frustrated about it because, um, they're, they're getting away with uh, all of it. They realized very recently the power that they have oh, and the way that they've skirted this, uh, the, the current mechanism they're utilizing is contract law, if you can believe it. They have legally binding contracts. They make their members sign. And when, they, and when those members uh, try to you know, leave and then try to sue the church for damages... Uh, they are presented with this contract and told, well, you have to go to Scientology's religious arbitration. And so far, the judges uh, on these cases have one for one said, oh, yeah, I guess so. Nothing I can do about it. Off you go. And you literally have to go back as a former member back to the buildings, back to the people who abused you for them to determine whether they abused you or not. And I am floored by the fact it it feels very twilight zone-ish that this is even happening you feel like you're looking at reality through a haze or something like wait a minute what how is this possible and yet we've watched it happen for years now my guess where i'm going with all this is not necessarily to argue that case but to wonder from your perspective and you guys have been doing this for way longer than i have what what do you, how do you see the legal landscape with cults in general? If that's one example of one way that they can game a system, how do we prevent that? What do we need to put into place so that judges and lawyers are aware of what's going on and call it for what it is? Hey, you guys are gaming the system right now. This is not okay. We're going to stop you from doing this. How, how do we get there? What, do you, what are your thoughts about that? I think you have to attack the contracts to begin with. How mm-hmm. were they obtained by the people? So, you know, in what universe is a billion-year contract something that any human being could uh, sign up for? 
Oh, that's okay. not the legally binding contract that they're that they're signing. No, no, right. it's a different it's an example. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, the contract. So you have to look at, at the circumstances under which people sign contracts. So there should be ways that contracts are invalidated. But, yes, when you ha- it's incestuous when you have the group judging its, itself. And um, it's one thing to have an internal process, but there should be an external overseer as well, because they live in the whole community, not just in that community. So that's one thing. But, you know, then again, it's changes in the law that inspired our course, because um, in 2015, the United Kingdom passed the Serious Crime Act, which recognized that coercive control was a pattern of behaviors. You didn't have to look at one particular incident to determine how serious it was, and that psychological abuse in and of itself is a serious crime. And that was an opening that I'd been waiting for, just something to validate what I was interested in and where we could say, look, there's a new a new pioneering thing happening in the UK, let's run with this and develop the course. So, I mean, it could have been something else, but that really gave us the courage to do it. And what did that law say? That law said, you know what you're doing. It's intentional. It assumes intent. You know exactly what you're doing. We need to fix the whole legal system where money doesn't buy you justice. Okay, this is a problem throughout the system. So, yes, if you have slave labor, you're going to have a lot of money. And groups often have what feels like unlimited money. And if you're an individual going after them, you feel pretty, pretty powerless. Yep. Yep. And loopholes, you know, people make mistakes. The good guys make mistakes that are picking apart the cults. They make mistakes. They file a paper late. And because they filed a paper late, a charge doesn't hold, right. you know. And right. there have been examples like that with cult leaders and things. So, you know, but then there were the Nuremberg trials. Go back to that. And um, and then remember, too, that the term undue influence comes from contract law. True, true. It's, you know. And which is something that uh, people fighting cults sometimes use that undue influence legally to try to fight back. Right. And although that was originally intended for people who like are making a will and who are, you know, in a very vulnerable position or unduly influenced to change their wills kind of literally on the deathbed. And, you know, Religions do that to people. They go visit people in the hospital when they're dying, and they go, why don't you leave some money to our church or our synagogue or whatever it is, our cult, our charity. You know, this stuff happens. Me, not the first wife, whatever it is. There's a lot of that that happens. And the law said that when that happens, one mind is substituted for another and we find that an interesting way of, of looking at it, that one mind got substituted for your mind. You still have your mind, but it got substituted when you signed that dotted line. Yeah, you know, so taken over taken over by the other mind, right? Over. That's right. That's right. So there's good things and bad things in the law. Yeah. That's a really there's good always. point. Uh, that's actually a really good point about the undue influence point, because that's probably a counter strategy for that specific point yeah. of contract law that I've been telling people, I've been saying, look, you know, we need some legal eagles out there to get on oh, the yeah. case on this, right? We need people who really understand this, because I'm not going to solve this problem, but somebody needs to. Yeah. And somebody who understands the law can do that. But I'm wondering more broadly here, right? Like, and you brought up the Serious Crime Act, which is g- per- perfect. Exactly exactly what I'm talking about. Here we have enshrined in the law in the United Kingdom the concept of coercive control as a legal concept. And that this is huge. This is gigantic because up until now, up until fairly recently, the law's view about somebody being taken advantage of is, well, it was your fault, idiot. You should have read it better. You should have known better. You shouldn't have put your name down there. And now we finally have the opening of the door of no. It wasn't their fault for being abused. It's the guy who premeditatedly abused that person, the man or the woman, who goes after these people in a repeating pattern of behavior. And this has been pretty much... 
as I understand it, this has been implemented at the domestic abuse level. Is that right? Yes, they coerce to control laws um, in the UK, different parts of the UK, but also in other jurisdictions, the same in the states in America that have got laws and coercive control, yep. are looking almost exclusively at relationships and families rather than groups. But what I would say is that there are other laws around uh, violent extremism, radicalization, and also laws around human trafficking and modern slavery um, that, that would also apply to uh, the practices of cults and groups. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a lot of legislation already, and I've never been convinced that a new law is necessarily always a good law. I mean, in other words, it's easy to create bad legislation, um, uh, whereas actually what we need is the better application of the law. I mean, what's really shocking is just how few times the law on controlling coercive behaviour in England and Wales has actually been successfully used in the absence of physical abuse. Absolutely right. The the, the bulk of the cases that have come to trial using the the law that was introduced now nearly 10 years ago, um, the bulk of those cases, um, there's been physical abuse, which, of course, um, people could have been prosecuted for that prior to the introduction of the idea that people could be prosecuted purely for psychological abuse. And I think the singular reason for that, in a way, is because there aren't adequate ways of measuring psychological abuse. We haven't yeah. yet cracked that way of being able to create a, objective measures uh, that beyond a reasonable doubt, to use the legal phraseology that would certainly be applicable in the criminal courts, um, to allow us to say um, a certain level of psychological abuse or the coercive controlling behaviour took place. Because what we know happens in the overwhelming majority of legal cases is that you get the she said, he said, he said, she said, he yep. said, he said, yep. uh, argument. And you get this in the cult um, arena as well, where it's one person's argument against another. So you get your expert witness on both sides. You've alluded to that already, that the fact that the cults are really good at appointing their um, own experts. Um, I think there's one other dimension to this that's really important, though, and I'm interested in your view about this, Chris and Linda, which is the kind of rubbing up of secular law, because... All the laws that I've just been describing are secular laws. And then, of course, there are also religious laws, too. You know, and I'm not talking here about Scientology, because I think that there's been a long history of groups that have used religious terminology as a shield, as a protection. But, but there are also, uh, you know, religious cults uh, or religions that I would describe as cult-like in their practices that have a genuine theology. And they have theological laws within them. And I think it, it's an extant question of how in modern society do we tolerate, it's like I was saying, saying earlier on, how does that religious law rub up against and coexist with the secular law? Um, because there are countries, and France in Europe is the, the shining example of a, a country that's adopted a secular law. But does that mean that those conflicts have disappeared. Hell no, those conflicts are are very present in French society. Uh, Much as I respect um, the the decision, you know, of the Republic to take that step six years ago, that would not be my choice, because actually what that's done is to just create a a culture where those religious conflicts exist, but just at a different level. So how do you deal, or how does one deal with a situation where there will be genuinely um, held religious beliefs, um, laws, if you like, about how um, a particular group should operate, and how does that coexist with secular law? And I'm not saying I've got the answer to that, but what I do think there needs to be um, is a much bigger debate and discussion about it where people are listening, you know, not not the kind of debate that we see sometimes between politicians where there's not an awful lot of listening going on, right? There's a lot of talking but not very much listening. I'll offer just one aspect of that for discussion now perhaps or to future date, which is that I think it's where the uh, creed 
is a, is a, is a, a come, uh, is affecting the deed. It's where the creed is affecting the deed. So it, it's going back to issues of free speech. And here I draw on Jan Alaric's notion of bounded choice to say that there's free speech, but there's then also bounded speech. And it's where the, there's that tipping point and where you see right. um, religious beliefs, the creed, in, in, in effect, influencing the deed or vice versa, where there's that dialectical relationship and where effectively... Uh, the creed is meaning that people don't have the ability not only to act but the ability to think and feel and come to their own conclusions about things and for me that's a, a solution because I don't ever want to say to somebody you can't believe what you want to believe exactly. but at the same time it's that old principle that you know you can believe what you want to believe as long as it's not hurting somebody else exactly uh, Exactly. Well, you can't regulate belief because, of course, you can't get into people's heads and they're going to believe what they're going to believe. But you can regulate behavior. And I, I've i been of the mind that we are, when you have swaths of a society built on the idea that we're not going to regulate this, you're asking for trouble. And I understand that um, in Western nations, and especially the United States, which was founded on and by people escaping religious persecution, it makes complete yeah. sense that you would yeah. set up the thing from the word go, you don't get to persecute my religion. I get yeah. it, right? It makes total sense. But people being people and groups of people being groups of people, right? We tend to take things and let them get out of hand. And I don't know that the original founders ever imagined in putting together what they put together here in the States, for example, that this was eventually going to be a nation of 300 million people who were going to be, you know, kind of at each other's throats based on geography and culture and different religions. Because they were like, look, I'm just trying to escape, you know, uh, persecution of my religion. I don't care about persecution of your religion, right? And so you, you get that kind of thing going on. Uh, it's okay, you know, it's, it's not okay to do it to me, but it's okay to do it to these other guys. And I, and I think that's where we need to have more oversight is where my direction, my, my thinking goes. And better policing of what we call religious institutions. We're so hands-off with it with it that it in effect is unregulated and the, and the Scientology example I gave is a perfect example of what I mean because it's religious arbitration the courts are powerless to touch it mm -hmm. that makes no sense because it's mm. because it is literally enabled a group calling itself a religion to engage in free form abuse of its former members and I do mean abuse. I mean sitting in a room without any representation, being yelled and screamed at, no recording devices, no no notes, no nothing. We're just going to abuse you for hours on end, and we're going to call this a religious arbitration. And the courts don't get to say a thing about it. So it seems to me that... Um, what I like, uh, for example, is in the UK, you have a public policy, public benefits test, and maybe it's not perfect. I'm told it's, you know, full of holes, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> I'll take that. Some regulation of these groups, some oversight of these groups as a, as a government function without it being, well, we're going to stomp you out of existence because it, it's a pendulum swing. We're constantly fighting the pendulum swing of abuse of, well, it goes too far one way, it goes too far the other. We give, we give oversight, now they're going to persecute religions. Well, we don't have any oversight, the religions take advantage. So it seems like we're struggling with, with people. With the, with the people problem at the bottom of this. And this is where my thinking always goes to is how do we, there, there is no perfect way to regulate it. There's no one size fits all solution to public policy, but it seems like more effort in that direction would probably be useful at this point, you know? Um, I don't know. Thoughts? Well, there's basic human rights too that just mm -hmm. shouldn't be violated in any of the systems. So, if That's you right. have children in a religious group that are deprived of education, right? If you have children in a religious group or a cultic group that are sexually abused, That's right. 
then, then the overall laws really have to be applied. And to be fair, when there was the problem in Philadelphia, in my hometown, with MOVE, which was a cultic group that was bombed by the city police, and um, there was a long history of conflict with the police. They had killed a police officer. There was a lot of conflict. They would come out with loudspeakers and annoy all the neighbors who would ask for help. Their children were dirty. The dogs ran free. There were oh my God. a lot of issues. It was sort of a back to nature kind of thing. Check it out, Chris. Um, and the garlic. The garlic. Oh, yes. They, um, the garlic. they would put a garlic clove in their mouth. Keep other people away. Now, that's not what they said about it, but it did have that effect. Wow. Um, we did that in prison. I worked with some of them in prison when I was a prison psychologist. But um, when the city, when these conflicts were building, some people in the city did um, consult with me and my colleagues. And uh, we said, get the children out. Use the existing laws. They're not being fed properly. They're not clean. They're not going to school. Get the children out yep. before, like, any confrontation. In the end, everyone died in their compound except for one child and one adult. The one child went on and was went to live with the parent who had not ever converted. And the one adult sued the city and got millions and rebuilt and so you know it's it's a very deep story there are a lot of aspects to it but the point is there were there were laws that could be applied same thing in waco get the children out you know we have laws that protect children that should supersede anything else Right. And we have laws that protect adults too, because we also well, we do. We have health, we have health and safety laws and safety. That, that protect people at work. Yep. Um, I've made, I've been making this argument for a long time that um, you don't actually need a new law, but you can change the application of the existing law to apply to congregations, to volunteers in uh, political parties or members of political movements. Uh, there's the same duty of care should apply to people in those roles as should apply to employees. Um, and then that requires a judicious approach to inspection. And all I would say there is, you know, there are examples of where we can say the state has overstepped the mark. Um, you know, I think, you know, we could all d discuss, you know, to what extent that was the case uh, with the Waco Siege, for example. Um, but, but I think there has to be a balance. Um, because there are, you know, certain scholars of, you know, of uh, new religions that will emphasise those oversteps by the state, but very, very reluctant to acknowledge the oversteps by the new religious movements or the cults themselves in terms of the, the harm that they have caused to their members. It's, it's if there's only one type of harm, which is the harm the state can uh, inflict if it uh, makes a misstep but the missteps within the groups need to be just wished away or, or seen as being the growing pains of, of new religions as they mature well that's all very well um, unless it happens to be your family um, that, that is right. being abused and harmed um, in those groups and, that, and that's where the, there is that basic issue of accountability so mm -hmm. um, there's another law of contract around the notion of unjust enrichment um, mm -hmm. which is less well known than that of undue influence yeah. but it's based on the principle in, in contract law that nobody should become enriched should manifestly benefit in, in a way that's unjust and, and which is unfair and which leads basically to the at the detriment of somebody else. And yet, I think one of the things that we've seen um, in certain aspects of neoliberal thought um, is the idea that that's okay, that the ends justify the means, yes. which, you know, and, and the ends justify the means, of course, is classic Celtic thinking, that it, it doesn't matter, you know, how you get there as long as you get there. That's right. Um, 
and that, and that for me correlates absolutely with the notion of unjust enrichment. So, you know, I you know I want to pay tribute to you know I've known a number of, of lawyers that have done great work you know um, over the years trying to use existing laws. There aren't enough of them. We need more lawyers that that get this. Um, mm-hmm. you now the ICSA community mourns the loss of. of Alan Shefflin this last year, who was really a leading figure, who really did get that. Um, but, you know, there's been other great lawyers within the ICSA community, like Bill Elberg, Robin Boyle-Lasia, others, you know, Linda Domain and others. Rosedale. Uh, Rosedale, is, of course, as well as our former president, who've, you know, really got this. And I think, in a way, one of the things that we are calling for, and others as well, is that as well as having dedicated master's programs like ours that does cover aspects of the law, um, that really this should be part of the legal curriculum, that we need a, a new generation of lawyers and judges um, that, that really are schooled in an understanding of how coercive control works in groups and relationships um, and that understand that at the intersection of secular law with religious and political ideas and, and um, yes. those laws too. That's I could not agree more because I think coercive control is the uh, is is the avenue of approach. That's exactly where I was going to go. Is um, like we have in cult in the cult recovery sphere, we have a. a, 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 a Unfortunately, a majority of therapists out there are clueless about coercive control. They just don't know about it. They don't understand the structure of it or how it's all or how it all works. And so when cult members, ex-cult members come to them, they're just you they did what to you? What? I go I you know, oh god, god I can't believe it. It, like you got to get over that, right? Like, yeah, people are really, really horrible to one another sometimes, and in groups situations that happens, and it's and it's a real omission that that's not part of a standard lineup or curriculum for therapists is that this is a class of people you're going to run into: people who've been trafficked, people who've been abused, people who've been in a cult. It's it's you know it's called the victim of coercive control. In the same way, we have that same deficiency with judges and solicitors and lawyers and and people in that realm where these are such new ish <laughs> concepts, not new behavior. We've been doing this for centuries to each other, but um, rel- you know concepts, legal concepts that I think uh, we are just at the beginning. We're still, as I like to say, we're still in the wild, wild west of this field. There's no regulatory bodies. There's no oversight commissions. There's no licensed cult recovery therapists. It's, you know, it's it's it all is just kind of we're all figuring our way as we're going here. And I think that's kind of what we're saying is, we realize we're still at the beginning stages of this, where we're just trying to get people aware of the fact that this is an actual concept that they could use, that they could bring into a courtroom, that they could bring into a therapy session, and go, hey. This is what's going on, and the people go, "Yeah, exactly." <laughs> Everybody will kind of get it. Um, some of the graduates of your program are doing that work right now, are trying to educate judges and law enforcement officials, just yeah. like some are trying to educate more therapists. And therapists are going through your program, so I think we need about fifty more <laughs> universities picking oh, up yes. this program. Well, right? That's right, and they're couple things that you've made me think about. One is uh, some psychotherapists run cults themselves, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. And I, I've been quite involved in helping people that have been hurt by psychotherapists who turn their practice into an ethical practice and manipulate people and tend to have a lot of group work. But there's something else that people don't talk about. Psychologists examine yourself. Okay, learn about your own vulnerabilities to coercive control. Come on yes. now. We're supposed to examine ourselves and get to know our own issues so that it doesn't interfere with the work that we do. Well, psychology programs and other therapy programs have been taken over by cultic groups where somebody says, you know, I went to this cultic group. It was fabulous. Everyone should go. We're all going to this marathon, self-awareness, large group awareness weekend. Everyone needs to do that as part of their training. 
which reminds me of when people said to me, you need to try all the drugs if you're going to work with addicts, you know, which I've done, work with addicts, not tried all the drugs. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> really, Linda? <laughs> but um, I really think this is, I, I want to tell you, we are big advocates for evidence-based practice and research and the importance of research. And there are a lot of people that are incorporating work that is not research-based, that's based on somebody's idea. And I'll tell you my personal view as to why psychologists in particular are vulnerable to this. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is my view. My view is that we can help people a lot with psychotherapy. Of course, I believe in that. I've dedicated my life to that. We can't do everything. We can't fix everything. Right. And you get to a point and you think, I've gotten everything I can get out of therapy. I still have my bad days. I still dump on myself. There's still days I don't want to get out of bed. There's still days I lose my temper. There's still days I pick up alcohol, whatever it is. So we're looking for the latest miracle cure. Okay? So somebody comes up with an innovative idea. It can't be well-researched because it's innovative. It might turn out to be something good, but it might not be. And people go running. So Rod will tell you, I've complained to him many times, my horror at going to professional accreditation courses where people talked about, he knows where I'm going, helping people with their trauma from the womb. Okay, there is no evidence that we remember things in the womb. With what brain? With what what? With what language? What are we talking about? Okay? Oh, come and on. Yet, now, hang on now. The reactive mind, according to L. Ron Hubbard, records it all. Now, come on now. <laughs> not to mention people that go back to previous lives. Okay? Right, right. You, you know, so, like, I think it's that... that awareness of our limitations as human beings it's painful it's it's existentially important and we have to recognize our own limitations and what we have to offer others and in that we become vulnerable ourselves to the latest craziest idea and so psychologists and other psychotherapists also join cults sometimes in a whole group and we also get conned by partners, and we're also in domestically abusive relationships, and we're human beings. And if you want to think, like the cults do, they're the victims, they got some flaw, they got some family problem, or they didn't get the love when they were growing up, you know, when, you know, they're like great people. You know, it's like sensitive people, people open to ideas, people that want to change the world. You know, it's not people we should look down on and say, oh, you know, they're flawed, they're, they're, they're easily conned. Everybody's easily conned, you know? Yes. And so I think that's one of the problems. Yep. I agree completely. I agree completely. In many ways, um, extending what I just said about the wild, wild west, in many, many ways, um, you know, psychology and psychiatry are, what, 150 years old at most? I mean, these are not, these are still baby growing yeah. fields. And it's not, a, it's not a cut on any progress that's been made. We've made incredible progress in understanding yeah. ourselves in the last 150 years and been working on this, right? 1879, very first psychiatric laboratory opens up in Germany. That's how long this stuff has been actually scienced. And uh, and that's right. not a very long time. So I think we, I think as you said, everybody, you know, here comes this new novel idea and everybody goes running. It's because we're still mm-hmm. figuring this stuff out. And it's, and, it's, and it's difficult for people to hear that when they want simple Simon answers to the problems that they're running into. And the fact of the matter is, it's not a simple Simon problem. Depression, anxiety, PTSD, you know, cult recovery. These are complex issues with lots and lots of things going on. And, um, and so the idea that a pill 
or a single session or, you know, some treatment modality all by itself is going to just take care of everything. And you're, and even the ideal of, well, I want to walk around in a blissful state all the time. Who said that is what life was supposed to be? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but I think the, I think if I can just take a slightly different position, Please. because I, I don't agree about everything, which is healthy. Um, um, I, you mentioned the, you mentioned the Wild West, you know, and I, it, it takes my mind back, of course, to to what happened, you know, when the the Spanish and the British and others came to the Americas in the first place, uh, and the way in which they uh, wrought havoc and destruction and murdered so many hundreds of thousands, millions of indigenous yes. um, peoples. Um, and it reminds me of the fact that um, indigenous psychology um, comes from a different starting point empirically than modern psychology. Hmm. And so while I completely agree that there should be, you know, tests of evidence for new approaches, and, you know, that Linda, you know, uh, is a practitioner in eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy or EMDR for short. Um, and Francine Shapiro first came up with the idea of that by um, watching the way that the wind moved through the trees and noticed that when she did that, it affected her thinking, leading to understandings around bilateral movement and the way that that can affect the brain, blah de blah. But that has been tested empirically but all i would say is that there can be things that um positivist modern um science cannot explain and mm -hmm. which nevertheless benefit people i mean if somebody wants to believe that the cookie monster is the thing that is uh, helping them you know get through the night um, even though he doesn't really bring the cookies, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm reminded, you know, I, I went through a period of my life when I was in my teenage years where I was systematically bullied for year after year, week after week, month after month. And, um, you know, I, I created um, somebody to talk to in my mind. You know, I, I don't believe that I dissociated, dissociated. I don't think I developed dissociative identity disorder if I did I, I got over it um, because that I, I don't have that imaginary friend anymore but the point was that it was imaginary and yet actually it was very real as well um, because it's what helped me survive yep. and, and all I would say is that whatever helps people survive should be respected on one level because um, the alternative to that um, is, is really you know, disrespect and riding roughshod over people's beliefs that just because you don't understand them, which is where we started in terms of cultic thinking. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that either of you are saying that for a split second, but I, I do think it's really important to um, try to be respectful of something that you yourself don't have any comprehension over. And I mean, and this gets onto a topic, you know, that you and I have talked about a lot which is the kind of what approaching the kind of far right political movements um, around the world, and in particular uh, the Make America Great Again, the kind of MAGA movement, QAnon movement in the states right now. And and while I, you know, um, really wanted Hillary Clinton to become uh, president, and and I was saying to you before we started uh, the podcast about my Hillary Clinton poster that I still have up in my <laughs> office over there. Um, nevertheless, the, the term basket of deplorables um, has kind of become a, you know, a standard bearer for, in my view, how not to view people that you fundamentally disagree with. Yes. I think it's very important to call out prejudice and discrimination for what it is. And I applaud Hillary Clinton for doing that in, in the most admirable way for many decades. Um, however, that does not mean that the individuals themselves are deplorable, their views are deplorable, and it's really important to kind of understand how people can come <clears throat> to those ideas, because the danger otherwise is that the kind of training, equalities training, that, that is given is all performative around people saying the right thing, doing the right thing, ostensibly because they want to you know be able to get on whereas their fundamental 
uh, views about others uh, remain unchanged. And I say that because unless you confront these forms of bigotry and prejudice head on, um, it often allows those things to, to fester and continue. So, I mean, I think, again, I know I'm extrapolating to a broad scale, but I think there's lessons here for how to deal with people in cults because <clears throat> the most important thing is to be respectful of the fact that people believe the things that they believe, um, to try and get alongside those beliefs and understand what they mean to people. And I, again, I would pay tribute to the many people in the you know, uh, exit counselling, exit work field who've really taken the field on in leaps and bounds over the last 20, 30 years. Mm. Um, you know, I'm talking about people like Pat Ryan, Joe Kelly, David Clark, you know, and in the de-radicalization field, Robert Arrow and others who've yep. really understood the fact that um, unless you can almost get inside the mind of what's motivating somebody to believe what they believe, um, it's very hard to draw people out of that milieu. So I suppose I'm making that pale for just the idea of um, understanding, really. Uh, I, uh, oh, I, I would agree with you. And, and let me offer this as a, um, as, a, as a perspective on what you just had to say, um, because this is something I've come to myself over the years since I left Scientology and at first had very, very strong anti-church, anti-organized religion, anti-belief beliefs, uh, as is usual for often, you know, often for many people coming out of a cultic, religious cult belief system. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, screw all belief. You guys are all a bunch of morons. But, you know, none of it's real, blah, 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 blah. You, you, it's natural that you'll spend some time over there at that end of the spectrum after yeah. you've been at one end, you, you reject it and go the other direction. Over time, that feeling has mellowed with me, and I have been uh, finding myself uh, far more tolerant, compassionate, understanding about believers, theists, people who have God belief or religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs or uh, chakra beliefs or whatever. I, I really don't care. It really doesn't bother me or affect me what somebody's carrying around in their head. And I came to realize after sort of mellowing on this, that you start looking at how belief can actually create good in the world and how there's how it can be necessary for that good to exist. And, I'll, and an example I'll give you is more than one um, reformed, managed, whatever word you want to use here. I'm not going to use the word cured. I don't think this is a cure. But there are people who have been diagnosed sociopathic, psychopathic, like deep, disordered people, criminal people, people in jail, people in gangs, people who have had rough lives, mm -hmm. who found Jesus, mm -hmm. found Muhammad, I mean, Malcolm X. I mean, we can go, there, there are precedents here, right, we can look at. And you look at this person, and you look at the epiphany that they have, a series of epiphanies. It's, it, I've, I've not yet found just one. I've always found it to be a series. And you, fee, and you see actual behavior change. Mm -hmm. Not a cure. They're not no longer egotistical, narcissistic people. But they come to an understanding by accepting a higher power, by accepting the fact that somebody on the block is bigger than me, if they're, mm -hmm. you know, kind of one of these violent types, mm -hmm. in a concept of Jesus or a concept of God, however that manifests for themselves. And if as a result of that, their behavior changes in a positive direction where they're more social, less violent, more able to get along with people, with their own family, they're not beating up people anymore, I can't argue, I can't look at that and go, well, your belief is stupid and you believe in a fantasy and what's wrong with you? That's the last thing I'm going to do to try to break apart or deconstruct that person's newfound faith because it's the mm -hmm. literal foundation of a new identity for them. Why would I want to mess with that? 
And once that became clear to me, you know, you you look at it and you go, oh, well, no, then the here and here and here, and you start seeing that the positivity of of what belief or faith or these ideas can bring for people in their lives. And you have to acknowledge the truth of that. And at least I did. And I went, yeah, that's a thing. And um, and so the last person I'm going to go, you know, try to do street epistemology on, or, you know, some method of deconstruction of their beliefs. Yeah, I ain't doing that with that guy. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so so I think, I, I don't know, that's, the, that's where my mind goes in what you were just talking about there as far as um, tolerance, compassion, accepting people for who and what they are. Not everybody has to be a carbon copy of your belief set in order for you to get along in the world. I, I, I think these are important points. I agree. And I mean, one of the big problems in academic life a lot of the time is that um, academics or academicians will look at somebody else's work and, and they will judge it according to their own frame of reference. You know, it, it, if it doesn't fit with my own uh, approach or epistemology or uh, etc., it therefore isn't worth anything. So so I, I agree fundamentally. Um, but of course, it, it doesn't overcome the that conundrum uh, of, of should intolerance itself be tolerated right uh, and at what point is there a tipping mm-hmm. point? because even though i think that um describing um you know the people that congregate around maga as deplorable um is not helpful um it is true to say that a lot of those beliefs are deplorable in the sense that you know uh, rampant bigotry um, against ethnic minorities, against the LGBTQ plus uh, population, for example, the, the erosion of, of rights for women. The, these are uh, deplorable views, in my view. Now, do I want to live in a totalitarian state where those beliefs cannot exist? No. Um, but that doesn't mean that, therefore, there shouldn't be a robust debate. And it doesn't mean that there shouldn't be protections in law uh, that stops those beliefs from actually discriminating against um, people. So I don't. I think it's very difficult to talk about the harms that cults inflict without seeing it in that broader context of, you know, the, the, that intersection between, you know, religion and law, and, and the and the balance that very carefully needs to be constructed and, and, and greater minds than mine have spent their careers on that and I think it's very important for all of us in the cult field to engage with that uh, literature, to, to engage with those uh, people. That's my take on it. I jumped in ahead of you there, Linda, so my apologies. No, that was good. I was also reflecting that religions serve other purposes for people, the sense of community, meaning, yeah. Um, they'll do charity work through a, a religious organization. Uh, it helps with loneliness. You can, you don't have to be with a partner. You can go to a service, you know, and feel surrounded by people. And there, there are a lot of needs that it addresses. Some of which cults try to lure people in with as well. And uh, it is a. It is a fine line to walk, but I, I just don't think that religious law should overrule civil law where you're living. Yep, That's I agree. Where I draw the line. Agreed. Agreed completely. I fall under the, um, and I'm pretty sure you guys would agree with me, that the, the, the mantra, respect the right to believe, not necessarily the belief itself. I will, mm-hmm. I will die for your right to believe whatever it is you want to believe. That's a right people have. Um, I will not die for your belief, <laughs> right, for the belief itself. And I think there's a big chasm of difference between those two concepts. Yeah, but the difficulty then is, you know, to what extent can that belief be expressed? Uh, mm-hmm. Because there are certain beliefs that cannot be expressed in civil society, even today, even in the United States. I think mm-hmm. there are certain beliefs that cannot be expressed um, uh, before law enforcement will be de- dealing with that. Um, mm-hmm. And certainly in other societies, you know, where, um, you know, a freedom of belief is less enshrined um, than it is in the United States or indeed through the European Convention on Human Rights, you, you see an even more draconian approach to that so i i agree i've always agreed with that principle but 
But then the issue is, you know, when somebody does express, you know, a belief that to the majority of civic society, civil society is seen as abominable or deplorable, to use that word again, you know, to what extent should action be taken? And, and this, you know, get, gets us wholly into the whole kind of culture wars debate on university campuses, you know, how right. to balance uh, freedom of speech with, you know, the, the importance of uh, protecting uh, people that are routinely discriminated against, um, whose lives are ruined by bigotry and discrimination on a daily basis. How, how to balance those uh, two things? It, it's a it's a very tricky balancing act. Um, it's not that there's no easy solution to it. But no. the right to believe, yes. But as I said earlier on, uh, those beliefs often have consequences. Uh, the, the the creed leads to certain deeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. Certain I mean, it's not straightforward in psychology. I mean, there's lots of research that shown that attitudes and behavior are not always aligned. Of course, they're not. People don't, as I said earlier, don't always act consistently day to day, week mm -hmm. to week. But sometimes they do, and sometimes those beliefs have profound uh, consequences um, for the way in which people behave in relation to one another. So this issue of how one then deals with, with cults is a, like Linda said earlier, a microcosm, I think, in a, in a way mm -hmm. of that broader yeah. problem, isn't it? You know, how do you balance that freedom to believe, which I would certainly support fundamentally, with the freedom not to be harmed? Exactly. And the freedom not to be abused. And the freedom to challenge beliefs. Well, well, exactly. And this th th that is literally the balancing act that we all have with the Bill of Rights, with these concepts of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, are these ba is the balancing act. It's the choice. It's the harder choice. It's the most difficult choice to make in putting a society together based on these principles. It's it, That's why, historically speaking, we haven't had societies like that. We've had societies yeah. that have been ruthless dicta dictatorships and authoritarianism because it's so much easier to run things that way. We've chosen the harder route where, oh no, we all get to be individuals and we get to think what we want. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> you know? And with that comes this constant. It's not, there's no, I think one of the, one of the, maybe the language itself is it fools us a little bit because we imagine that there's some stasis point we're going to find, some perfect balance we're going to find between these things when it, it, we're constantly changing and we're constantly moving the goalposts on ourselves because that's the nature of society and belief and, and social agreements. What's okay today wasn't okay 50 years ago. We, having this conversation a hundred years ago on the subject of civil rights and blacks in America would have been a, you know, a very different conversation because mm -hmm. of the social change. Same with the LGBT uh, community mm -hmm. and, the, and the rights afforded to that and recognition afforded to that community. It's, it's a changing thing. So we have to build systems that allow for those changes and are, lo and are fluid enough that we can, that we can, kind of do this with it more than try to hold it still I think you know is is how I think about think about that at least and I, I know I'm being over general here but I, I think that's an individual struggle for people too yeah I mean I, I that, that that's the thing about you know do, do you have a fixed mindset or do you have a growth mindset right. are you open to to change and, and ideas i'm not saying that it's wrong for people to you know believe strongly in what they believe in to to stick to that um but it i think what's important there is understanding the motivation as to why people want to to remain steadfast to views that may be objectively disadvantaging them and may be also objectively discriminating and disadvantaging other people. You know, what is the motivation behind that? So while, while it's not about forcing people to change their views and certainly not about the state forcing people to change their views, I think examining and having the dialogue about what motivates people, a lot of the time it's a sense of fear, uh, either fear of um, uh, the afterlife um, or, you know, uh, a fear of, you know, what I'm going to do with the rest of my current life um, and the need for certainty. And I think yep. being able to 
have an active dialogue about those principles of actually what does it mean to be a human um, and, and to exist. You know, again, that's not a kind of thing that we teach particularly well in schools, is it? Um, no, you know, and it's not. I, I think it's. I think it's really important. I mean, there were attempts to do it. You know, um, we have, you know, educational strands in the UK that attempt to do that, but. Um, people make up their minds sometimes at an early age that I'm that type of person. We all do it. it it's, a, it it's what's called in psychology self-stereotyping. You know, I'm good at this, I'm bad at that. Right. So because I found some math exams when I was, you know, at school, therefore I'm bad at mathematics, you know, whereas actually, of course, in different circumstances, maybe I'd be good at mathematics. Maybe I, if I'd been taught better, I would be better at mathematics. Maybe if I wasn't being bullied every day of the week, I'd be better at mathematics. You know, there's all sorts of explanations um, that, that mean that at different times. So, you know, people can believe in different things. I think what's one other thing that's come into my mind is one of the things that has often given me hope is when I've seen interfaith um, communities working. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes, incidentally, you know, humanists alongside um, you know, people of religious faith. Yes. Uh, talking about their different beliefs, not trying to convince the other person, but, but actually coming to the realization that at, at a deep level, they have a lot more in common than they thought they did. Yes. And that actually they can coexist at yes. that level, um, almost what I would call a superordinate level. And, and I think that's what breaks down the cult, the cult walls, not the cult walls, that's a different issue, but the cult walls um, is that, that understanding that, you know, you can have strong beliefs, but that does not mean that you should build a wall around you that, um, you know, means that people learn to hate and learn to disparage everybody else. That's right. Well, just as they learn to hate, they can learn to be tolerant. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do think that the laws have helped educationally. So although we haven't had a prosecution solely for psychological abuse in the UK, more people talk about coercive control. More people ask me in my practice, do you think my partner is being controlling when this happened? Yeah. Do you think I'm being gaslit? Gaslighting is quote on as a popular term. Yeah. And because of that, there's a little less stereotyping of people that are in cults. There's yep. just a little more recognition that people can be fooled, and you know um, that's really important. I, I could not agree more. In fact, I think what we're talking about there is that creeping awareness, right? That's that the yeah. gradual social change. It's a slow. It's painfully slow for those of us who want it's things, you know, going slow. right. The, found, the founding fathers, as you rightly admired in their brilliance, also had slaves. They also talked about liberty for all men. I mean, they had their own limitations, and it took longer to work out these issues. And they also persecuted people of other religions. They didn't get that right away, you know. That's right. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you get these heroes that have wonderful ideas, but they're also flawed. And it, it takes time to work out these things. That's right. That's exactly right. And I don't think there's any substitute for it any more than in an individual's life, you know, there's any substitute for experience. You can teach yeah, and teach yeah. and teach until you live it. You know, it's just not real to you. You know, you, it goes for, it, it needs to go from here to here. And, and until it does, it's, it's not, you know, and everybody gets it when I do that. Right. Cause it's, it, cause it's, it, it's totally clear. It's, it, you know, when you know it, when it's there and it's, and it's a certainty for you cause you lived it. That's when you're a believer and, and, um, and, and we have to, and, and that bridge is always different for people. People have different experiences and different ways that, that their ideals become real to them, I guess we could say. And so that's the whole heart of the conflict of it is everybody's different. <laughs> they are different, and they're different in, in their capacities. Some yeah. people are better thinkers than other people. Some people feel things more intensely than other people. People operate on different levels as well. But that doesn't mean that people in general can't get the basics of this. And I think the, the first thing is to bring down that shame about having been in a cult. Uh, let's, yes. just, let's just keep bringing that down a notch, a notch at a time until it's gone. Exactly. Poof. Let me uh, let me throw this at you guys. Um, 
as an idea because I I've glommed onto this as something that is that explains things to me in a in a in a wholesome way, in a way that makes sense for me as far as if I was looking at the dashboard or the control panel of of the of, of human behavior. I, I think very much about that that old movie Inside Out, you know, emotions and that kind of thing. But I think about a, a longer term concept of this, which is emotional needs. Uh, mm -hmm. Not just your feelings in the moment, your anger, or your grief, or your frustration, or whatever you're experiencing right here and now, but the longer-term stuff, the things that the, the things that live deeper in us, um, the need for community, the need for identity, the emotional need for meaning and purpose in our life. Yeah. There's different categories of of it, different models of it, but it all. I don't really care what model you're using. They all kind of go to the same place. Of we have these mm -hmm. buckets within us. And until they are filled or, or, or the struggle of our life is trying to fill them. You know, we, we mm -hmm. want the, everybody's different in terms of what level they're trying to arrive at. My sense of community is satisfied differently from yours, but we both have it. Yeah. And I think this is universally true. I, you know, there's so few things that are universally true of us. We are, we're so culturally oriented or educationally oriented. But I think this is a way of looking at people outside of the context of their intelligence or their mm -hmm. knowledge base. Because that's fluid. That's different from person to person to person. But emotions, mm -hmm. the emotional needs are always there. And I think they drive us. I think they drive us in, in, in very basic, basic ways. What do you think w about that? Yeah, I think uh, much of what we do is emotionally driven and, and not particularly thought out. A lot of major decisions that we make in life are based on our hunch. Mm -hmm. I think I would like to live with this person the rest of my life. I'll get married. I think this house would make me comfortable. Okay, I'm willing to spend all this money on this place where I think I can feel at home. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we make, uh, I think this job, this is the right, I'm going to accept this job. You know, you don't know that much. You're taking guesses. So a lot of, a lot of really important decisions are based a lot on emotion, actually. Mm. Yeah. And it's the complexity of emotions that gives richness to our lives. Exactly. Rod? Most definitely. Most definitely. And uh, Henri Tajfel, who created social identity theory, who was a survivor of the Holocaust in um, Belgium, came to the UK, um, became a professor at the University of Bristol, uh, described in terms of... Um, identity with social groups, what he described as the emotional value um, significance of you know being a, a member of a group, and and it's the emotional part that that I that came in, into my mind when you mm -hmm. were describing emotional needs, Chris, because mm -hmm. in psychology we tend to sort of divide psychology up into different bits, which is very common in academia, so that we all have our specialisms and uh, pretend that we don't know anything about the rest of it when we actually do, but um, the, the point about <laughs> crossing those mini silos um, is that um, cognition is emotional, that the way we think is, is based on emotion. Yes. Uh, uh, and what I was articulating around the motivation for beliefs, uh, and I think that the, one of the biggest issues there is um, that, that's emotional is to avoid fear or, or the notion of fear. You know, um, why am I here at an existential level? But what's going to happen to me and the people I love? And the fear that you know what I have is is going to be lost, um, or the fear that my life is going to come to an end and I'm not going to have achieved anything meaningful. Um, the fear that I need to be a great person in order to feel good about myself. I think these are all the motivations that lead people into cults and into um, extremist movements. And, you know, obviously it was uh, FDR who said we have nothing to fear but fear itself. But I think that if we can tone down the fear uh, in terms of that big emotional need, um, then and I think we can do a lot to start to not only heal how people feel about each other but also take away the breeding ground for cults the thing that cults completely 
body is the notion of the fear of the other, yeah. uh, the fear that we are the chosen people and that everyone else are the fallen, uh, the fear that we're on a divine mission um, compared to everybody else. Because, you know, if I'm not doing that, then what, what is my life all about? You know, and I mean, you know, you and I, Chris, have both been through that uh, process of leaving that behind and having to face up with the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm just a regular person, right? I mean, maybe a, an amazing regular person uh, in your case, Chris, but you're still a regular person in the sense that, you know, you've not got that billion-year contract that Linda referred to earlier on, after all. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to lead the workers' revolution, right? Um, and the main reason I'm not going to lead it is because, as I said earlier on, it's based on fundamentally flawed principles that have killed millions of people. I don't want to see that happen again. Yeah. So I had to re-educate myself in, in the belief that my life's mission was going to perhaps be more modest. But in modesty, there's also profundity. You know, in modesty, there's also humanity. Right. In modesty, there's also love. You know, and... and Grandiosity, I think, is the the uh, enemy of of understanding and love, actually. And I think that's what you see in the groups is that grandiosity a lot of the time um, that gets in the way of all of that. Oh, completely. I can't. Yeah, I, that's a great way of putting it um, because there's no, you know, it's it's so empowering. It feels so amazing to feel like you're on the side of right to feel like yeah. you're in the in the right you you're you're in the right place you know you're in there at the right time for you know great things and all this like hyperbole this yeah. very hyperbolic language and unfortunately you know life shouldn't really be that exciting <laughs> uh anyway yeah it's um Cults are funny. Cults are funny. There's about five other things I want to talk to you guys about, but we're running uh, up on almost two hours now, and I'm thinking we might want to start wrapping up and maybe schedule another time to, to talk more because there's a whole sure. thing on cult recovery and, and return and other stuff I want to talk to you guys about, but I, sure. I, have, to, I have to close off for today. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask, you know, based on all the things we have discussed today, we've really been kind of focusing on the, on the legal side of stuff and on on the kind of the bigger picture side of things. Were there any other thoughts or ideas you all had that you wanted to share that we didn't uh, get to today in this? I just want to say that we love the diversity of things that people do that come out of our program. And you have such a great talent at being a great conversationalist. Oh. And you're educating so many people and you're giving support to so many people. And I'm just really proud yeah. of you, Chris. Oh, yeah. well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very you, much. Yeah, not a lot of people can keep a conversation going for two hours. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I mean, you're really good at it. <laughs> I, I feel the same way. And you can combine that with the knowledge that you have. Because you could have great conversations about, you know, different kinds of dogs or whatever, right. you know, and that would be okay too. But like you're using your talents to spread the word, and that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. One thing, yeah, one of the things that I'm eternally grateful for is the fact that I've met you, Chris, I've met other students on our program, and that I actually enjoy our conversations. Not just now, but I enjoyed our conversations when you were on the program. So you know, um, it wasn't, it didn't feel like work to me. You know, when when we talked, I mean, it was work related. You know, and and you know, doing a program, I pay tribute to you as I do our other students. It's not easy. No. It's hard stuff. Yeah. Uh, but actually, at the same time, um, those conversations were amazing and will will stay with me. Oh, so. awesome. Well, thank you, guys. I, I swear I didn't pay them to say those things. Thank you very much, you guys. I really appreciate it. I got to tell you um, as well, just to just since we're doing this, that I, I cannot. There are no words for how much gratitude I have to the universe or whoever uh, to have met you and to have done the work that I have done with you guys. Um, the, the Salford program, I have said, is the second hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. The first being the Scientology prison program. Uh, getting through that thing was 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 kind of torture. This was not. This was hard, but it wasn't torture. <laughs> But I, but I undid the, the reason why it was so hard 
is because your program was a concentrated time period in my life where I undid a lot of what was done to me. And that was not part of the program. That was not what I was there for. It wasn't what it was put together for, but it was a side effect of it that was undeniable. It was it was an emotional roller coaster for so many reasons for me. And getting through it was one of the most um, major accomplishments of my life. And so um, and I, and there's zero percent chance that would have happened had it not been you guys running the program um, because your care and compassion was what helped me get through it. So uh, so right back at you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Yeah. And, you know, education can be transformational. Yeah. Um, it isn't always for people, but, but it can be. And it, it's a wonderful thing when you, when you see it uh, being um, for, for you and also for others too. So I always just feel privileged to be uh, part of something which can be like that for people. Um, absolutely. absolutely. Awesome. Awesome, guys. Well, both of you, thank you very much for taking the time to sit with me today and do this. I really appreciate it. If people want to reach out to you or want to know more about the program or or have questions for you, where exactly do they go? What link should I put in the show notes or how should they reach you? Could I put a quick slide up? um, Oh, sure. Of course. Yes. (laughs) We came prepared for that question. (laughs) Throw it up. (laughs) So that's a slide about the program overall, just to give you the yeah. um, As you said, it's the only program in the, the world that um, covers coercive control across, across the context of relationships, extremist groups or cults, radicalization, trafficking and gangs. That's a little bit about how we uh, wanted the program to come about looking at that spectrum of coercive control across context. That's how we see the intersection between those different ideas. We c- coercive control right at the center. Um, these are the areas that we cover on the program, as we've uh, talked about um, today. Fully distance learning, live lectures recorded as well. You can study the program full-time over one year, part-time over two years. Um, this is the structure of the program. Um, we can talk more about this if people are interested. Um, sorry that the, there's more slides. I'm trying to get through to the um, contact information. Those are the courses that you do um, on the program, two courses per trimester and then a dissertation or research project. Those are the other forms of the program, just to skip through that. Um, and that's about the online delivery of the program, which we um, are really committed to having as well as the live and recorded lectures, one-to-one tutorials with students at different in different time zones, as well as a lot of resources that are available on our uh, virtual learning platform. There's lots of different career pathways for students, whether or not they're already working in the field. And then finally, finally, that's the link for people to follow if they're uh, interested in applying uh, or you can just Google the psychology of coercive control. There ain't no other. It'll come up. Perfect. 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 Okay, good. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, guys. So out there watching, listening to the show today, uh, you can contact them via Salford University. And I highly recommend you do so if you have any questions or interest in that program. It's everything you would imagine it is and more. Uh, (laughs) And on that happy note, let's go ahead and wrap up. Again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Folks out there, Uh, Subscribe to the channel if you are not already. Uh, Get your uh, weekly notifications if you don't already. Uh, And I will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.